we always say that god does whatever happens is always for the best and god is very kind and he looks after the whole universe why people like hitler ever existed and became successful killing millions of people and where would our faith go in terms of accepting god's wish yeah it's it's a tough one and there isn't an easy answer the way that i think about it is god has created the universe god is kind i don't know that you could say everything that happens is for the best i think that's more of what we would consider a platitude than a truism um i think it's something we say to make people feel better i'm not sure that it's actually true everything that happens is in service of our own awakening so if you look at it like that then yes it's for the best but i think that we could certainly come up with a best that was better than a lot of people suffering the fact that people were able to get closer to god to have awarenesses to have realizations there's definitely a part of me that wonders well wasn't there another way for them to have that realization and i don't know the answer to that so i i know that god is kind i know that god is there i know that god is is perfect in the creation but i don't think that god micromanages everybody's free will i think that this is why we are counseled to turn to god because i think it is in the act of turning to god that god then responds i remember when i first came to india Pooja Swami ji told me a story. You have to bear with the story realizing that he was telling it to a 25-year-old American PhD student who knew nothing about Hinduism, zero, nothing about India. So he told me the story like this. He said one day God was having lunch with his wife. And I remember I was like, "What? God lunch his wife what do you mean now obviously the story was vaster and more complex but instead of getting into the names of the different divine manifestations who he knew i wasn't going to know who they were he was trying to make a point so he simplified it he said so one day god was having lunch with his wife and he said suddenly in the middle of lunch god got up and he ran out and his wife thought oh my god what happened and a few minutes later god came back and sat down and finished his lunch and his wife said and of course you know when you talk about god's wife we understand that we're speaking about you know lakshmi narayan you know that, that he's he's talking about a divine shakti and he was just oversimplifying it for my american sensibilities so i would understand what was happening in the story so he said god's wife asked what happened where did you go why did you run up and you know run out in the middle of your lunch and then come back and god said well one of my very very close disciples devotees was being beaten on and hurt and called out for me and so i knew i had to run and immediately take care of him but then just as i had gotten out the door the guy picked up a stick and started beating everybody else and so i thought well all right if he wants to handle it that way i'll go back and finish my lunch now 
It's obviously a guru's oversimplifying of a complex story for a not very attuned mind at that time. But the moral was very clear, which is we've been given free will. God is there as we turn to God. If we turn away from God, obviously we are going to suffer the consequences. Obviously the law of karma is there to make sure that whatever seeds we plant are going to bear fruit in our lives. But I don't think that God micromanages. I think that's why he gave free will. I don't think that he's there micromanaging, making sure that no one lies, that no one hurts, that no one harms. I think he's given us free will. He's given us scripture to guide us. He's given us what we call buddhi. Our intellect, our intelligence, should be our purity for us to use them, to turn back toward God. And yeah, as there is day, there is night. As there is light, there is darkness. And as there is goodness, There's deep, 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 dark ignorance. We don't think so much about evil because the soul is pure. But there's so much ignorance sometimes that gets so attached to the body, to the way of thinking, that it absolutely blinds us. And when it blinds us, it hurts others. How someone like that wasn't, you know, struck by lightning earlier in his life, I don't know. If I were running the universe, I certainly would have done that. But I remember when I was doing my PhD, I had a teacher whose husband was a chaplain. And they were very, very religious. And this teacher, she worked with children who were dying of AIDS. And one day someone in my class asked her, because of course none of us were very religious, and everybody was very sort of bewildered by somebody who was very religious. And somebody asked her, they said, you know, how do you, how do you hold on to your belief in this perfect God, in this divine plan, while you spend so many hours every day with children who are suffering and dying due to no fault of their own. And she said something that I love so much, and I've held it so deeply as I've become a deeply religious person. She said, I never doubt the perfection of God's plan. I never doubt the perfection of God, that presence of the divine plan. She said, but I do sometimes find myself asking him whether maybe there couldn't be a better plan. And, and I loved that because it, it brings in that humanness that we all have, which is we're not able to see the full tapestry. So when you say it's all for the best, it depends what you mean. The best in this moment? Of course not. How could that possibly be the best? There's absolutely no scale whatsoever of any valid measure by which that level of suffering is the best. And if we expand the scale, and so instead of from looking at this much, this intersection of time and space, those 
physical bodies that those souls had taken for that part of their karmic journey. And we're able to expand our vision of the tapestry, not just decades, but hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. I do believe that there would come a time at which that vision of the tapestry would give us a sense of, oh, it would make sense. We would understand why that all had to happen the way it happened. It's like when you look at Lord Ram. Why was he sent on? This embodiment of goodness, of dharma, of integrity. Well, it doesn't make sense until you go all the way back to Shravan Kumar and King Dasharat having killed him and the curse that Shravan Kumar's parents gave to King Dasharat that as we are dying due to a broken heart of the loss of our son, so you too will die someday of a broken heart due to the loss of your son. He had no son at that. But if we look at Bhagwan Ram being exiled in just that intersection of time and space, it's why we look at Kahike and we think, you know, she's the evil one or she was brainwashed by her maid. You know, we look at it very narrowly. But you go back far enough and you go back to Shravan Kumar and you say, oh, okay. And that doesn't mean it's for the best, but suddenly it all makes sense. Suddenly the tapestry is full and it makes sense. And I do believe that if we go back far enough, all of this awful evil that we see would somehow make sense in a global tapestry. But that doesn't mean it's for the best in the moment. Or that it's something sh that should be repeated on any level. You know, sometimes, sometimes I think that there are souls that on some cosmic level, willingly, consciously, take certain births for the purpose of teaching the world a lesson. That somehow on some cosmic level, these souls of those people who came in as the six million people who were killed by them, that somehow there was some cosmic agreement that they had seeing where our world was going, seeing the hatred, seeing what could have happened. And somehow they agreed that they were going to take birth in a way that that's what they were going to go through so that eighty years later we're still saying never again. Eighty years later, when there is anti-Semitism that pops up, everybody stands up and says, we need to address this. When there is discrimination, when there is violence, that people are so attuned to the possibility of what could happen. That there's an entire office at the United Nations of genocide prevention. That there's been a ripple impact in the universe, in the world of what's happened after that. But sometimes I think maybe, maybe the explanation isn't looking at how it could happen and what those people had done in the past, but rather a cosmic sort of covenant in a way that they all took to sacrifice that particular life 
in the service of a huge ripple impact on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, 